Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us. And I'm so excited to have one of my favorite singer songwriters joining me this week for a conversation about COVID and how it's affected um, the creative community, particularly musicians and artists. And um, most of you probably know I'm Mike Schreiner, the leader of the Green Party of Ontario and the MPP for Guelph. And I'm so honored tonight to be uh, joined by Joni Narita. And uh, Jody is a Toronto-born, Jamaican-Canadian singer-songwriter uh, and musician <clears throat> who is a staple in the Kitchener-Waterloo and Guelph area, though she moved from Guelph uh, over to KW, which we'll kind of forgive her for that. We like but to I have came back. back Guelph. I came back. Yeah. You come back. Oh, yeah. Dude. Oh. <laughs> Why did you tell me that? That's awesome. Surprise. Surprise. <laughs> so, uh... So Joni is known as a soul R&B artist, songwriter, jazz vocalist, uh, as well as somebody who performs some incredibly fun and engaging live performances. And most of you probably know Joni's um, album Bloom, which came out in 2015 and is played everywhere. I think it was part of the song track that opened this. Uh, but I told her that I actually have to go back to her debut album in 2007 for my favorite songs. So your debut album was A Fine Time and the song The Way of the World, which you've told me now you're going to play some more now that I've mentioned this, because I think it's a song that holds politicians accountable. And mm. so every now and then when I feel like I need to be held accountable by people like you, Joni, I go back and listen to that song. Uh, and it really speaks to me. So I highly recommend it to anyone who, who's an aspiring politician. But I know tonight we're here to talk about uh, <clears throat> COVID and, and how it's affected the arts community. Uh, and I just want to say that um, to maybe to finalize the introduction is, is just one of the things that I really admire about you personally and so many artists is that I can't tell you how many times I've been in an event that's a fundraiser for a local community organization, uh, an organization that, you know, maybe is to help um, with social justice issues or to help feed people who are vulnerable. And I can't tell you how many times you've been one of the musicians performing. And I know oftentimes that you've done that either as a complete donation or for very little remuneration, even though, you know, you're a struggling artist yourself. And I think it just says so much about you and so many personally, and also just so many people in the arts community, how much you deeply care about the communities you're a part of. And you certainly exemplify that both in your music, Joni, and also uh, in just the work you do in our community. And I just have to say in the interest of full disclosure, not only you are you a great songwriter and musician, but you also, uh, I think, are an aspiring politician. One of the days. <laughs> you, you keep did telling me. You a great me. <laughs> job in the last provincial election in 2018. <clears throat> I won a town hall in Guelph, which you moderated and asked me some tough questions. And uh, that was a really memorable night, along with the fact that you uh, played a played a, at an event that we held with Elizabeth May and David Suzuki. Yeah, Earth Day. The largest political rally in Guelph's history. So I just want to also thank you, uh, I think in the interest of full disclosure, for your support for me in the past uh, during campaign. So thank you for that. You're so welcome. I just also want to take a moment before we, we just talk just to acknowledge that 
Um, you personally, and I think many people in the black community probably are feeling a lot of pain and anguish and grief right now that, you know, we've experienced centuries of anti-black racism, anti-indigenous racism and racism against people of color. And that's really been brought to the surface. Uh, it really has. Uh, way in the last <clears throat> week. And so I just want to thank you for agreeing to come on. Um, I would have understood if you'd said, you know, things have changed in the last seven days, but um, <laughs> But I thought it's important to, to acknowledge that and maybe we'll mm -hmm. do that in part of our conversation tonight. Yeah, yeah, I'd love that. I actually just came back um, like 10 minutes before our sound check from Kitchener Waterloo's rally, um, which was really quite moving for me and my husband. Great. Yeah. Hopefully we'll see you at the rally in Guelph on Saturday. Yeah, on Saturday. <clears throat> Good. Yeah, so thanks for agreeing to, to be on tonight. It really means a lot to me. So Thanks I just want to open with the COVID side of things and just say that I know I've heard you comment uh, just how the COVID crisis has affected musicians um, mm -hmm. in general and you personally as a musician. If you want to just maybe share a little bit of that. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> it was fast and furious. Uh, you know, one moment we were sort of all looking forward uh, in our calendars. I had CD releases. Um, that were coming up and a mini tour in the States in the Northeastern part of the States. Um, and my husband had just started working at Stratford, which he was loving and that uh, um, halt on all of that. I, I mean, obviously musicians are not the only ones who have been hit, but uh, it was really sobering to know how quickly it all just got upended. And all of a sudden it's like, wow, what is this year going to look like? You know, we can't be together. Part of the musician, part of the part that we love about being musicians is the camaraderie and uh, the exchange of energy in the room, mm -hmm. you know? So um, having to try to figure out all this technology stuff that we're, <laughs> that we're all doing, <laughs> yourself included, um, you know, it's nice to keep in touch with people that way, but we, we really miss um, being together and I really miss sharing music with people like in the moment and, and seeing, uh, their faces and their smiles or their tears. Yeah. Yeah. It must be hard because I'm thinking <clears throat> as a politician, I feed off of the energy of the crowd and the people in the room and to, and especially with your music is so engaging and there's such an energy there to, to not have that live connection must be really hard. Yeah, it's been challenging. Like, um, I've been asked a couple times to do live stream concerts. And <laughs> at first I said yes. And then I, I'm uh, in full disclosure, I actually chickened out. I was like, this is too weird. <laughs> I tried to do a, a few practice runs, just, you know, taping myself and talking to the camera as if like there were people. And I was just like, wow, I really depend on people and, and their feedback and their faces and their energy so you know hopefully I figure it out because it looks like <laughs> it's going to be this way for a while but uh yeah it's it's it wasn't just a switch you know mm -hmm. I'm sure you I'm sure you feel that too right where it's not just yeah. like okay now I know everything about streaming <laughs> and I have you know the right lighting and the right you know things to say when there's not people to feed off of yeah it's it's interesting humbling <laughs> it, it really is yeah no mm -hmm. I, I can imagine <clears throat> And I'm just thinking even just like musicians, like like the sort of the way in which we support musicians in many respects, I think is broken right now, um, pre-COVID. Pre-COVID, yeah. But it seems like COVID potentially has even made it worse uh, and even more challenging because of the lack of live performances. Yeah, and I think like maybe it depends on where someone's at in their career. Like, you know, maybe if you're Beyonce, it's really easy to, <laughs> you know, have a live stream concert with all your techie team helping you and charging a, a cover or something like that. Um, not to say that it's impossible for artists sort of at my level, but it's certainly more challenging, I think. Also because I think everyone has a lot on their plate. Maybe they've lost their job too. Maybe they've got screaming kids at home that now they have to wrangle 24 hours a day and stuff. So yeah, it's been interesting. But I feel like the conversation has actually um, been brought up a lot, not just by artists, but by fans, that it's important to 
support the arts in whatever ways you can, you know, if it's joining someone's Patreon, if it is um, adding a tip to their tip jar, if they're doing the live stream thing, downloading music, but paying for it and, and that kind of thing. There, that conversation has been brought um, to the forefront again because of this, which is a good thing, I think. Yeah, and do you, th do you feel like the uh, <laughs> government programs that have been out there to help people, um, have they supported you as an artist and other artists? Um, a lot of artists I know have been being kept, we've, we've been kept afloat by CERB for okay. sure. Yep. Um, there still seems to be like a bit of um, gray areas in terms of, you know, is it when we did the work or when we invoiced for the work or when we got paid for the work? Because sometimes for an artist, that's completely all over the place. <laughs> um, but um, it has been, it's been helpful for me, um, for sure. And for my husband, he was a recipient of CEWS. That's the one that they help um, with wages. Right. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. And a lot of my musician friends, not all, but many of us have, have been um, on CERB and many of us have received grants like um, Alicia Brilla and a lot of friends I know um, have done the National Arts Awards or National Arts Center grant where you right. perform for an hour and it's a thousand dollar grant, which is awesome. So yeah, there, we have been, we have been helped. It's not always enough, but okay. we have been helped for sure. Good. And I guess in your family, it's, it's a bit of a double <laughs> whammy because your husband does sound, right? And, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and without live performances, and you also mentioned the cancellation of crap or like, yeah. like how, like, so it's in a sense you, you've both been hit. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. 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 Um, and um, have you been able to, um, uh, you talked about Alicia being able to access the arts grant. Have there been any other grants available that you've been able to access um, or that other artists um, may have access? There's one that um, I've applied for through the Canada Arts Council called Digital Originals. Okay. So it's about like a four to six week time period um, to know if I got it, but I did apply. So that's a $5,000 grant and it's in conjunction with the CBC who toss in another $1,000 um, for their sort of top picks. Okay. So um, the whole idea is to help with exactly what we're doing. <laughs> so figuring out how to exist online and keep the, the exchange going between you and your audience, uh, hopefully building your audience online and um, you know being able to make a living. <laughs> right. And yeah. You know, one thing <clears throat> I found interesting during COVID is you know, there's been a lot of talk about people, you know, streaming Netflix or whatever their video services or whatever, but a lot of talk about people just listening to a lot of music and mm -hmm. really kind of finding <laughs> solace in our physically distant kind of isolating world in music. And totally. so are there ways that, you know, individuals out there can support musicians in this kind of broken model that's out there, but you know, still there are avenues that people can support musicians online with music and maybe an opportunity is to share that with folks. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, <clears throat> a lot of, uh, of us have music, music that is available, you know, on Spotify and iTunes or Apple music and the like, but we also, pretty much all sell that stuff right on our websites and mm -hmm. um, merch as well. So if you can buy directly from the artist, that means that we get a larger cut. In my um, case, I get 100% of um, the sales that I make directly from my website. So just, you know, being more cognizant of that type of um, thing. If you're noticing that you really listen to an artist a lot on Spotify or something, maybe you should go to their website and actually buy their album, even if it's a download, but at least that you've, you've given your 9.99 and you know <clears throat> had your support that way. I think also uh, if you don't maybe have the budget to support monetarily because you know, <laughs> COVID-19, <laughs> um, there's so many free things that you can do to help support artists and businesses in general. If it is just talking about favorite songs and sharing them or um, sharing YouTube videos and saying, hey, I love this artist, check out this song. You know what I mean? Um, I think 
the weight of the word, like just word of mouth, it still matters. So there's, there's lots of ways and uh, things that you can do, even if you can't spend actual money. Because <laughs> I know I can't spend a lot of money right now. <laughs> yeah. no, I think it's such an important point. Um, I know <clears throat> our mutual friend, Andrew Craig, another great Guelph musician. Uh, mm. I was at one of his concerts like two years ago. And he, he you know, he's an environmentalist too. And I, I do. Know, he handed out these little like download keys. He's like, instead of buying a CD from me, I'm just going to give you this download key to go to my website and download the music totally. as a way to really start encouraging people to go directly to artists' websites. Because, you know, obviously, I mean, maybe you could share uh, like, you know, what you get versus, you know, through, I guess, <laughs> iTunes or Spotify versus somebody going to your own website and what a difference that makes. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's less than pennies that we make <clears throat> per stream uh, on Spotify. Apple Music's a bit better. Um, but it's still, you know, you've got to be in this superstar stra uh, status to actually be able to make a living from it. Um, radio is better and uh, internet radio also good if you're um, a member of MROC and doing um, just having, there are agencies that collect for us on um, the internet as well. So um, there are ways, but <laughs> I think like there's nothing that beats uh, getting it directly from our websites. And I also think that um, a lot of people now are looking at the model of subscription. So you've probably heard of Patreon. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> there's, it's, you know, it's, it's more or less um, crowd funding, but it can be set up in such a way that maybe you're like, I love this artist so much. I can afford $10 a month, you know, <laughs> or I can afford a hundred dollars a month, whatever it is. Um, there's different ways that you can set it up and we artists try to give you perks that the regular person isn't privy to, you know, maybe you get to see videos first, or maybe you get access to music that um, everyone else doesn't have access to and that kind of thing. So the subscription model, I'm personally looking at that and mm -hmm. trying to tweak my website to be able to um, have that. And it's kind of cool because then it actually kind of forces us to be regular with our sharing and our output, you know, get strict about um, making art, which is what we're supposed right. to be doing. And we have time to do it now, which is awesome. <laughs> so I, I want to shift gears a little bit. And um, I want to ask you about what you think the um, <clears throat> sort of music world, live music world especially, is going to look like post-COVID. And as we sort of come out of, like, and we don't even know when we're going to be out of this. It could be a year, it could be two years. Like, so like, what do you think, what do you think it's going to look like? Or, or do you even know at this point? Literally every day I say to Will, I just wish I knew what it was going to look like. <laughs> I just wish I can't, I can't picture it. it. Like if I picture what it will look like, it's got to be at least like a couple years down the line because I can't mm -hmm. see how a venue can afford to, operate at let's say like half capacity or 25% capacity so that they can honor, you know, physical dis distancing and stuff like that. So unless it's outdoors, I'm really having a hard time um, seeing how it's going to work. And, and I'm trying to be optimistic. And I know that, you know, people in, in the arts are really resilient and like mm -hmm. creative or literally creative beings. So I'm hoping <laughs> that there are things that I haven't dreamed of yet that we're going to have to start, you know, um, manifesting so that we can come together again uh, sooner than later. Cause it, it feels, it feels almost um, impossible at this point when you think of ventilation, the fact that we live in Canada, so you have to actually close doors and windows, you know, past November, let's say. And <laughs> for us singers, we are projecting our droplets everywhere. And, you know, apparently that's a really efficient way of spreading the virus. So <laughs> um, it is it is overwhelming to think about, but I hope that there's going to be like a resurgence in like, I don't know, like some sort of art renaissance because people are going to be so hungry for it. Maybe mm -hmm. there's going to be more backyard parties where there's live music. Maybe there's 
going to be smaller um, setups where it's just one or two musicians at first instead of big bands, you know. Um, but I, I hope that we're gonna we're gonna dream it and make it happen. <laughs> yeah, no, I feel the same way, and I, I keep them out. I, every time I imagine it, I, I I can visualize it outside. So like Hillside, which Hills, those yeah, of you with yeah. the Guelph area know Hillside, and you've played Hillside many times, and <clears> I think it's like. So I can see us painting like little circles. We're all six feet apart. And, exactly. Know. Outside. Yeah. But, but inside, inside. I know. I, it, like, it just really is hard to imagine what it's going to yeah. look like. Yeah. Because like, I wonder if you're even like a venue the size of River Run. Okay. I don't know what the capacity is, but let's guess that it's 1500. I don't know if that's even correct. But from what I understand, you would have to be at like 25 to 30%. Yeah. So how, how could you possibly staff your building properly and pay the artists what they need to, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I just, <laughs> 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 I can write a song about it, but I don't have the answer to that one yet. <laughs> well, actually, you know what makes me think, so has this been a good time for songwriting? Like, I'm just thinking, you know, we have to be physically distant. You're probably yeah. a bit more isolated right now. Like, is it a time for kind of introspection and songwriting for me it has been yeah um not so much at first I think maybe the first few weeks were sort of like shell-shocked yeah and uh you know just like looking at all the updates and and trying to get a sense of what it even was but um once I sort of settled into oh this is a long haul yeah I've gotten busy with songwriting I've been really um treating it like uh, a job <laughs> I, it gives me a purpose and a function to get up and uh, do some yoga have my breakfast and coffee and then um, get to music quicker than I normally would have uh, normally would be able to you know mm -hmm. not having um, the performing schedule and teaching schedule the same allows me to yeah just really go through my old notes and like oh yeah that's a great title I'm gonna write a song about it now and then I do it and then I make a demo and record it and it's yeah I've been actually quite productive in that regard at least that <laughs> right so if, if other musicians are like you we're gonna have this proliferation of new music <laughs> coming out of COVID <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh, what do you think the government can do given the challenges we've talked about and what a <laughs> what recovery is going to look like for the music industry. Like what are some things, you know, government could do? Uh, I'm on the committee as my pick tomorrow. I start at nine in the morning and I go till 9.30 tomorrow night talking tourism on the economic recovery committee. So if you were presenting to us on what government could do to support musicians and, and the industry, like do you have some thoughts on, on what, what we could do? Um, I, I think that supporting us as individuals is important as well as um, supporting the organizations and venues that we we play at but mm -hmm. um, I would just maybe caution um, governments to not let the not let the little guys fall through the cracks you know we don't want to only see um, the Sony Center standing at the end of it we need like the registry theater and we need like um, the Guelph Black Heritage Hall. And you know what I mean? Yeah, we, need, yeah. we, need those, we need those small and mid-sized venues to be able to stay afloat, whether that means um, helping with rent forgiveness or um, extending them being able to pay their staff uh, and that kind of thing. I think that's really important. And I know a lot of us musicians are really, really hoping that Justin Trudeau is going to extend CERB or morph CERB into some other sort of format so that those of us who are not able to go back to work <clears throat> because of the nature of our job, that we can um, continue to get help, whether that means we switch on to EI or, you know, I'm, I'm not sure the ins and outs of that, but that's a discussion that's happening a lot um, because a lot of us, we were hit right at the beginning. So we had that first like March, April CERB and then our next one in June in a, about four days is that's the last one <laughs> that we're eligible for. 
Um, so, you know, once you pay your bills and your rent and everything like that, like we don't have a lot of savings, we're musicians. So it's, it's a bit scary. Like what is uh, August and September and October going to look like? And certainly we can look at trying to fill our time with part-time jobs and, and this kind of thing. But I, who knows if, like, are there enough of those kinds of jobs, you know, at the local bakery or cafe to even sustain everyone who's going to need work? And also we need art. So I, we hope that, um, that somehow CERB gets extended or, you know, morphed into something that, that makes it last a little longer for us. Okay, so you, you've teed me up. <clears throat> I'm not gonna interject with too much policy, but I have to right now because <laughs> you know the Green Party has been advocating for basic income for so long. And I feel like in a sense CERB is that. And so I'm hoping that as June comes to an end, that the federal government, the provincial government will somehow figure out a way to transition that into a basic income. And I think, you know, for, for artists in particular, it's critically important, but for so many people, just to make Absolutely. sure that there's a floor that, you know, we provide a basic floor that no one can fall below. Exactly. And that'll have for health, community, uh, employment, job creation, the arts, arts, et cetera. Mental health. Mental health, absolutely, right. yeah. <clears throat> and so I think like we can, a lot of us can, um, you know, a lot of us are still teaching, but not nearly as much as we were before. Like um, most of us lost quite a number of students if, if we were teaching at all. And obviously gigs are, are <laughs> few and far between, but we, we are resilient. And so we're, we're making some money, but it's certainly not enough to sustain a household and, and feed yourself and everything like that. So yeah, universal basic income would be amazing okay. for everyone. I will work on it. <laughs> I, I know you will. I know you will. I know you will. So um, I uh, related to that because I was also thinking a lot of the part-time work that musicians will find too a lot of that's not open right now because I'm just thinking cafe, yeah. cafe. <laughs> all those things, right? Like, yeah, yeah. You're going to be one of the last things to open up. So even, mm -hmm. even that, you know, extra supplemental income isn't there right now. Yep. Yeah. It's true. It's true. I want to shift gears a little bit to your music. Uh, okay. And so, <clears throat> as you know, I'm a big fan. And uh, part of the reason I'm a big fan is there's so much social commentary in your music. And you really talk about you know, the world in which we live and you, you talk about it in a, in a personal way, but also in a social societal analysis kind of way as well. And so I'm just wondering, do you want to spend a few minutes just talking about like what's going on right now in society and, and, uh, yes. <laughs> and give me a bit of your perspective on it? Yeah. Um, hopefully I don't cry. I'm actually quite emotional. Um, like I said, we had just come from Kitchener, Waterloo, where uh, it was just bananas. There were so many people. It was beautiful. Um, I think that the conversations that are starting to happen for some people, like everyone is at varying degrees of understanding what racism is, what systemic and structural racism specifically look like. Um, this is news to some people. Black Lives Matter is new to some people. Like maybe they've heard it as a hashtag, like somewhere off in the distance, but it's, it has come to a head in this last week in a way that um, is really visceral and urgent. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that can only be a good thing as long as people remain vigilant about doing their part because there are so many little, little ways that uh, systemic microaggressions add up in a person of color's life. It's not just someone saying, hey, you N-word in the street. I, I actually can deal a lot better with that. That's like, well, screw that guy. And on to, you know what I mean? Right. But these, these structural ways, these systemic ways that um, do not allow people of color to be free, like really free in, in the ways that white people take for granted, um, they add up. 
And that's not even taking into account the lives, the lives that are taken and threatened. You know, it, it, for me, it's twofold. There's the, there's the um, idea of the police and the way that policing is done. And we need to like undo all of that and start again. We need to be funding social projects, social justice, uh, food banks. We need to like build people up so that there are not, there's not a need for policing in the way that we think that there is. Because a lot of the things that need policing are coming from systemic issues, you know, lack of food, lack of, of proper housing. Um, so that's one part. And then the other part is understanding how silence is violence and complicity. So being brave and bold enough to not just um, slap a BLM hashtag on your Instagram on a Tuesday because it is in fashion, but to actually have the courage to go to your workplace and say, well, what is our stance on X, Y, and Z? To email your MPPs and MPs and um, all branches of government and hold them accountable for, um, for fixing these problems. And it's not, it's not only black people who are struggling. We know that indigenous communities are reeling just as much as we are, although we are in the limelight right now. And right. so I just, I really, I just really wish that people would see how deep it is and that our country is literally built from blood the blood of the people who lived here first, the blood of the people who came across and uh, didn't have a choice, but we're here now. So you, you have to take the responsibility every day, not just when it's in fashion. You have to use your voice every day, even when yeah, you're really tired, even when you kind of got called out by your friend on Facebook and now you don't know what to do because you said it all wrong. Like, it's okay to get it wrong. People email me every day. Uh, my inbox is like full with people asking me, like, what can I do? I don't know. I want to say something, but I don't know if I'm going to say the right thing. And it's like, who said anything about doing it right? Like, it's a journey. Just like if I want to be a better accomplice for the LGBTQ um, community, I have to be willing that I'm going to, I have to be willing to be corrected. Sometimes I have to be willing to amplify their voice, not try to speak for them, but I can just speak from my heart. So I think if anyone's wondering what to say, if you just sit with the feelings that come up for you when you're seeing these images and these videos and reading these stories, and you just articulate what is on your heart, it can't be wrong. Junie, I know um, it, it must be just all the microaggressions in particular and just almost even the fear, like, you know, some of my friends who said, you know, I'm scared of driving down the street and being pulled over for being yeah. walked, you know, I mean, yeah. all like going shopping and being followed around the store, you know, all the time, all the time, you know, and all that must just wear on your, your mental health. And, and it must feel like just this weight that's on you. And I feel like sometimes in your music, you must be releasing that weight. Like I can feel it in your music. And can you maybe just talk about like how, your, how you express that in your music and what role that plays just, you know, in you as a person? Yeah, it definitely plays a big part um, in my music. Uh, it's sometimes it feels a bit um, like, wow, am I really going to go out and sing this song right now in front of a sea of white people? Well, yes, I am. OK. <laughs> um, but, you know, music is the great like uh, equalizer, right? It brings people together so I can say things in song with certain rhythms that maybe go down a little bit easier than they would if I was just saying it to someone, you know, just speaking or just typing. Um, the older I get, like I've, I've, I've always written about social justice issues because that's sort of kind of, that's sort of how I became a songwriter, uh, in earnest when I was in Toronto and a part of a couple organizations <clears throat> that were, uh, social justice and immigrant for, uh, focused. So they would like, we would go to a rally, let's say, and they'd be like, okay, Joni, 
now you've got to write a song about free Palestine and go, you know, <laughs> like, so that I didn't know it at the time, but they were really preparing me um, to be able to like bring issues to light, but try to do it in a way that maybe like tricks the audience in a sense where they're like, oh, this is, this is fun. Or, oh, I like this groove. Oh, what's she talking about? Oh, oh, you know, <laughs> um, I, I enjoy doing that. It's cathartic for me. Um, and you're right. Sometimes I write really from a personal place. I, 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 I felt this, I did this, but sometimes I just try to put myself in the position of, you know, humanity, uh, as a observer and, and ask questions. Is it possible that we could do X, Y, and that? <laughs> could we envision it? Could you speak about it? Um, what would happen if you did this kind of a thing? Yeah, well, I, um, I'm so thankful that you have put yourself on that journey and express yourself through your music and the way you do, because it's incredibly powerful. And I'm, I'm curious, I know we need to wrap up pretty soon, but what, what motivated you to become a musician? And, and to write the kinds of songs that you write? I always wanted to be um, an entertainer since the time, like, you know, when I could speak, it was like singing and dancing was always uh, the thing. Becoming a songwriter specifically, I guess like in my early 20s, it was sort of, I was uh, like many people singing covers, um, mm -hmm. doing the clubs in Toronto and stuff like that. And sometimes it was just like, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about this. <laughs> this is what's important to me. So really just wanting to like, you know, to find my voice in the world. Um, I'm a bit shy by nature, like personally, even though I'm a, a musician, if there's a party or something, I'm definitely not the life of it. I'm usually, you know, in the back or whatever. So being able to show myself through my music uh, felt appealing. Um, although I always wanted to be uh, a, a singer, at least. I wanted to be like Diana Ross. <laughs> it didn't really go that way, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, your your music's beautiful. So, um, Thank you so I, much. I I just want to just wrap up and just say make one final plug. Uh, can you turn music into political speech? <laughs> All right, what are you where are you going with this, Mike? <laughs> yes, maybe <laughs> to be continued. <laughs> to be continued. <laughs> so I, I just want to thank all the people who have joined us tonight. And I've told my team that the, there isn't much, so there aren't many silver linings out of this whole COVID crisis. But one of the things that for me has been really special is for weekly now, I've been doing these kinds of yeah. with like pretty incredible people like yourself. And it's really meant a lot to me. And, and so thank you for, for joining us tonight. And I just want to thank everyone who's watching online. Uh, and a part of these really important conversations. And um, I know the Integrity Commissioner doesn't allow me to endorse or sell any one product, but I will encourage people to go uh, check out your music. And remember, there are ways that you can support musicians more directly than indirectly uh, that you had, you shared tonight. And uh, thank you so much, Joni, for- Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you. Thanks everyone.